Hello and welcome to Power Up Your Life, brought to you by Live Well Events and Fabletics. We will get going with our next and final session, um, Power Your Mood Through Food, in just a second. Just some housekeeping notes. Um, please post any questions for Clarissa, for Clarissa in the Q&A area. Use the chat to say hi to each other, interact with each other and the session. And most importantly, enjoy the session and remember to tag us in your pictures from the day on Instagram at livewellevents and at fabletics.eu. So without any further ado, let's get going. Hello everybody. So it's time for our final session of the day, Power Your Mood Through Food with nutritionist Clarissa Lenner. The food we consume can have a powerful effect on our mood and mental well-being. In this session, you'll discover the link between certain foods and poor mood and understand what you should be eating to help make our happy hormones and boost the body and mind during times of stress. And this doesn't mean going out without your favourite burger, daily latte or Friday night G&T, thank goodness. Clarissa will share how best to navigate these foods and drinks and the importance of 80-20. You'll also learn about the fascinating connection between the mind and the gut, often referred to as our second brain, and come away with tips on how to boost your gut health every day. So over to you, Clarissa. Hello, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining. Now, I just want to... Um make sure you guys can all see my screen and all is set up and well. So I've heard you've all had a wonderful um, sort of day of great events and I can't wait to catch up with the recordings. But as um, I've just been so lovely introduced, I am here to talk all things mood and food. So first up, I'm gonna be sort of just touching it on the background and giving you sort of an understanding of the role with food and nutrition, stress, mood and anxiety, because it's a little bit more complicated than just thinking, oh, I eat a burger because I want to eat a burger or, you know, I eat chocolate when I feel down. There's such a biological um, relationship that occurs there that I want to talk a little bit more about because it will help you understand how you can choose the right foods to support your mood. I'll then talk sort of quite simply about blood sugar and energy balance. And it's a very easy thing to be able to introduce to balance your blood sugar levels, not just for your mood, but for energy, weight management and many other things which I'll touch on. Then spotlighting key nutrients for your mood that we should be obtaining. Gut health and why we call it our second brain and that's something I'm incredibly passionate about talking about. Caffeine and its role on mood. So um, I'll be really interested to hear who drinks caffeine, how much, etc. A little bit on stress eating and, um, you know, sort of the 80-20 rule, which is something I'll delve a little bit deeper into. And finally, some top tips, takeaways before I will have time for a Q&A. So um, please do feel free if you have any questions throughout to pop them in the chat box or in the Q&A. I will do my best to answer them throughout. But if I don't, I will get through to them at the end end of the session and answer them for you. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Clarissa Lenha. I'm a registered nutritionist trained in nutritional therapy. I have my own private practice on Harley Street. So for those of you that know London, it's a stone's throw from sort of Oxford Circus, Bond Street area. However, I have moved for the foreseeable future to offer more of a digital practice. And to be honest, I'm absolutely loving it because it means that I can you know, do workplace wellness talks, see clients um, privately, speak to wonderful attendees of well-being sessions all from um, anywhere that I want to be in the world or from the comfort of my home, own home safely. So I'm really enjoying it because it means I get to reach lots of audiences and when I'm not in my own private practice, in my clinical practice, I do um, specialize in corporate wellness and workplace webinars. So if you work for a company that thinks it needs a little bit of well-being TLC, please do get in touch with me. And um, a little note, in my clinical practice, I do specialize in gut and digestive concerns, which you will see I shine about when I start talking about gut health, weight management, hormones, and uh, those in particular female sex hormones, but also thyroid thyroid health and autoimmune conditions. So now you know a little bit more about me, let's talk about food and mood. So 
there's, you know, so many different facets and parts of this relationship that occurs between food and mood. You know, we do need food to function optimally as human beings. And a poor diet, which is filled with certain kinds of foods that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, can send us on this thing called an energy roller coaster, which you may or may not have heard of before, and I'll, I'll be talking about it in a moment. But this energy roller coaster, when we're up and down all day long, unfortunately, what can happen is our mood and emotions can also follow suit, as, as well as our um, performance, concentration, productivity, etc. And skipping meals in particular, or you know, perhaps not eating as well balanced meals when we are eating, can leave us feeling, you know, low in energy, feeling um, a loss of clarity. It might trigger anxiety, aggression, emotion, mood swings, etc. So we really want to be making sure that we're giving our body really consistent fuel so that it can function optimally, rather than going all over the place. We do need a balance of certain nutrients and vitamins from our diet to even create some of the neurotransmitters and hormones that are responsible for making us feel happy and feel pleasure. So for example, serotonin is our happy hormone, which you'll hear me talk a lot about today. Dopamine is our pleasure hormone and stress, uh, our stress hormone, one of our main stress hormones is cortisol. And I can't go without saying that, you know, overconsumption of sugar, caffeine, alcohol, all of these things can trigger changes in your mood, can trigger anxiety for some people, can trigger mood swings, aggression, etc., whatever it might be. And so I'm not saying that you need to cut these foods out by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm here hopefully today to help you navigate um, a few of these things so that they don't interfere with your mood or impact your mood. And I can't go without saying that you know, when we're talking about the relationship between food and mood, food for the soul is so important. You know, food historically has been one of these things that binds people together, brings people together. You know, think about the family meals that you may have once a week, sharing food with friends, talking about food. You know, food even plays a part in um, people's cultures and religions. So there is also something really important about this idea that we need to eat also for our soul, not just because it's nutritionally balanced. And I will be talking about that um, sort of slightly towards the end, how we can navigate that health. So let's talk about balancing blood sugar levels. Um, and I'm just checking the Q&A and I will get to some of those more complicated questions that aren't on the content right this minute a bit later, but someone said they can't see the screen, so hopefully they can now. Now, I was talking about this blood sugar energy balance just a little bit before on this roller coaster. Now, what I really just want to highlight very quickly, I'm not going to go too deep into this diagram here, but you'll see we have these two green lines. There are where our body wants our blood sugar levels to fall within. Now, taking a little bit of a step back, blood sugar is what all of our foods are broken down and converted into, into glucose and glycogen. And those are our body's preferred source of fuel. And so we really want our energy levels, which come from that form of energy, glucose and glycogen, to sit within that healthy blood sugar range. However, certain foods can spike us up and cause us to also dip below. And that's what that energy roller coaster is. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I know when I'm you know, full of energy, perhaps I've eaten, you know, um, it could have been a piece of cake, a cookie, whatever it might be. You know, I've got loads of energy. I you know, feel like I can finish all of my emails or, you know, go out Saturday night and stay up to 4am, like in the old days. Um, and then, you know, an hour later, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm exhausted. I need caffeine or I need more sugar or I need carbohydrates. And that's because the spike is very short term and temporary. So you're going up and you're falling even further down. And when you fall down, with all the willpower in the world, if you let your blood sugar level drop below that healthy blood sugar reference range, you're not going to sit there and go, you know what I fancy, some boiled eggs or a handful of almonds or some steamed broccoli. What you want is energy rich foods to get you back up. And unfortunately that sets off that energy roller coaster. And I know for me that when my blood sugar level drops really low, I can often feel a little bit anxious. I can lose a bit of concentration. I might have more mood swings. And so we do really want to be avoiding doing this all day long with our energy and our mood. So how do we do that? Well, very simply, 
eating balanced plates for our mood. Now, this is one of the foundational things when it comes to nutrition. This is going to help you balance your blood sugar levels, give you energy, weight maintenance, um, help with your concentration, productivity, performance, but also it's going to help you balance your mood. So this is applicable to everyone. Now, very simply, you just want to be making sure you have the right ratios of foods on your plate to make sure that you're having that consistent wave-like release of energy rather than the highs and the lows. So first up, try and aim for a quarter of your plate as complex carbohydrates. And the reason why we want to choose those complex carbohydrates is they're still complicated. They haven't been refined like the white versions of carbohydrates. They still have lots of the fiber, husks, bran, etc., still within them. And why that's important is fiber takes a really long time for our digestive system to break down. And that means instead of going up high with energy like white carbohydrates can do, it's a slower breakdown and therefore release of energy. So always try and choose those complex carbs. So swap the white rice very simply for brown rice, black rice, raw rice. Swap the white pastas for the brown pastas. Choose um, quinoa, oats, whole wheat and rye and pumpernickel versions of breads, things like that. Then you want to make sure at least quarter of your plate is protein because protein helps keep us satiated. So it helps keep us really full. And often I do see those people who tend to graze or snack a lot or don't feel you know, entirely satisfied are often missing out on either protein or fat. So um, I don't know if anyone wants to share. Are there any vegans, vegetarians, pescatarians, plant-based, non-meat eaters? Let me know in the chat um because protein require getting your hands on you know as much protein can be slightly more difficult mm. but you know again you want to have quarter of your plate of protein or for women it's about a palm of protein per plate or for men it's about a palm and a half and you can get protein from meat, uh, tofu, tempeh, poultry, fish, eggs, nuts and seeds. You do get protein in pulses, which also contain a little bit of complex carbs. So the things like the lentils, chickpeas, beans, etc. Then you want to have, actually I'll talk about fat in a moment. Then you want to have sort of roughly half your plate or two good handfuls of color of the rainbow when you can. So lots of fruits and veg, they can be frozen. Frozen are often more nutritious than fresh. They retain more nutrients. So don't be scared of frozen, particularly when it's harder to get to the grocery stores and get fresh produce. And try and get those colors of the rainbow because they're going to give us antioxidants and polyphenols, which are anti-inflammatory. And anything that you can do to bring down inflammation when um, in the body is going to be fantastic for many reasons, including for immune health, but also for our mood, because a lot of mood related disorders can be triggered because of high inflammation levels in the body. So colors of the rainbow whenever you can, and that can be local and seasonal. It doesn't need to be some exotic berry shipped in from Timbuktu. It can literally just be carrots grown in England. Um, you know, purple cabbage or um, kale, etc. And with the fats, don't skimp on fat. As I mentioned before, you know, I often see people grazing when they skip on fat and um, that can be really bad for, for mood and energy levels. So do try and include that good quality source of fat. And for women, it's about a thumb worth of fat. For men, you can go to two. Some women like to go to two. It depends on your requirements and your exercise, etc. But, um, you know, good quality fats come from um, olive oil, nuts and seeds, avocado, avocado oil, rapeseed oil, um, sesame oil, coconut oil, um, and milk, you know, good dairy produce, oily fish, um, etc. And I will be talking about oily fish in a bit um, and its importance. And somebody has asked me, what about protein shakes for protein sources? Definitely. Just make sure if you're buying a protein powder that the ingredients list doesn't take up half the carton, which unfortunately they normally do with sweeteners and artificial sweeteners and colors and funny things you can't pronounce. Um, I would go for just pure whey or a vegan vegetarian um, protein powder, such as a pea protein or hemp. So now, you know, very simply, balancing your blood sugar levels for general health and sort of stable mood. Now I want to delve a little bit deeper now that we have that foundational knowledge into key things that you can spotlight to really help you set you up for good mood and support your mood. But first up, before I delve in, I do want to run a little bit of a poll. So hopefully I'm going to have some help from the LiveWell team here. So who currently takes a vitamin D supplement? And it can be sort of, were you taking it this year? Are you planning on taking it in the next, you know, sort of month or two? Let me know. Mm. 
the poll team, I'll let you decide when you want to close the poll when you think enough people have voted. And the results are in. So 43% of you said yes, 15% sometimes, 20% have done in the past, 8% no, not me, 15% said should I? So that 15%, I will be sharing the news with you now. So let's talk all things vitamin D. You've probably been reading or seen a lot in the news about vitamin D. Obviously, we can't avoid what's going on in the current climate, but vitamin D plays a seriously important role in our immune system. But also, it plays an important role in energy production, bone health, hormone health, sleep, and neurotransmitter creation. So it really helps us produce and support and create and secrete serotonin, that happy hormone I was talking about before, and dopamine, our pleasure hormone. So it's really important to make sure that you're getting your vitamin D in um, all year round. And I'll explain why in a moment. But, you know, there are studies to suggest that low levels of vitamin D are associated with 11 times higher risk of depression. And I have to tell you, my clinical practice, I can spot people normally if they're deficient in vitamin D. They'll tell me, you know, that they've got sort of slightly sallower skin. Maybe they're very low in energy. They get colds and flus all the time. And their mood is really, really low. So make sure, my first things first, I would say, if you think that's you, get tested. You can go to your NHS provider and ask them or better you do a finger prick test in the comfort of your own home so you can just do it and send it off in the post and they'll tell you if you're deficient because if you're deficient taking the recommended daily intake which is 10 micrograms or 400 international units isn't going to cut it because it won't help you get back up so get tested to find out if you do think you're deficient otherwise the recommended daily intakes 400 i use international units now the reason that I ask for people taking a supplement is because between the months of October to April, the NHS does suggest taking a low dose supplement because if you live in England, I know we're having a heat wave at the moment, but when you live in England, we don't get sunshine for many months. And unfortunately, that is our most best, richest source of vitamin D comes from sun exposure on our skin. So between those months, we're very unlikely, especially with travel being limited, to be able to get that natural vitamin D in. And then even during the summer months, I mean, we don't always get the best weather anyway, but if you work indoors and you don't get exposure to natural light, then you're not gonna get it during the working day. If you wear sunscreen, which you should to protect your um, skin, it does block um, your absorption of vitamin D. And um, you can't get it through glass, it must be in direct sunlight. So it can be actually very hard to get enough. Now, you can get a bit in your diet, such as dairy, egg yolks, mushrooms, fatty fish, such as salmon, but it's so hard to get enough. And you kind of know when the NHS is recommending to take a supplement between the months of October to April, which by the way, this year they said May because of currently in the current climate with everything going on, that it's a good idea to take a small maintenance dosage or get tested. Now, um, a company that I like, you'll see there, is called Better You, and they do a vitamin D spray alongside they do the testing. Um, it's very affordable, it's about seven pounds, and you just spray it under the tongue. And why I like that is that it goes directly into the bloodstream under your tongue. Um, and by the way, I don't work for them, I'm not their ambassador, uh, but it's one that I think is very good because it's affordable and it does, it bypasses the digestive system, so it goes directly into the blood. So it is a really good one to try out. So then I want to talk about omega-3. Now, feel free if anyone, I, I did ask earlier on if anyone's vegetarian or vegan, but if you are, let me know, um, because omega-3 consumption is slightly different with uh, vegans, vegetarians. Now, omega-3 is absolutely critical for normal brain function. It is a fatty acid, so we get it from fat-rich foods. And it is so important. And unfortunately, our bodies cannot make it. Not like some vitamins where we can actually make it. Omega-3 we can't make. We must get it in from our diet. And when it comes to mood, there's some really interesting emerging research coming out about all of the different roles of omega-3 with mood. But omega-3 is anti-inflammatory, which is fantastic for many reasons. But one of the sort of very interesting ways that people, that scientists are now uncovering the root cause of depression or the trigger of anxiety, depression, mood-related disorders is a increase in inflammation or inflammatory processes in the body. So anything we can do to bring down that inflammation is really going to support our mood. So we do want to make sure we're getting these in. So we've got some vegetarians and veggies that don't eat eggs, but eat dairy. Uh, so 
I'll talk about you guys and what you've got to do in a minute. But for those of you who do eat fish, the fish that you want to be getting are smash fish. Now that's not some sort of tropical fish. It's an acronym that stands for salmon, mackerel, anchovy, sardines, and herring. And they are really omega-3 rich fish. So you want to be getting in two portions of these fish every week to get in your recommended daily intake. Now for those of you who don't eat fish or don't want to perhaps eat fish extracts, um, uh, or in a supplement, for example, then um, you can go for plant-based versions of omega-3, such as chia seeds, walnuts, flax seeds, soya beans, but you need to have five times the amount to get the same amount as fish because the conversion of the different fats found in plant-based sources isn't very efficient, so you need to get a bit more. Um, so you want to have about five 30-gram portions of those nuts and seeds or beans uh, per week to get the same amount. The alternative is that you can take an omega-3 fish oil supplement. You want to be going for one that's got more EPA than DHA, which is the different fats found in omega-3 as a ratio. So if you're interested in supplements, pop it in the chat or Q&A and I can tell you which one's my favorite at the end for mood. Um, so that's omega-3. And now we have gut health, which is the thing that I am most passionate about. So we're going to run another poll because I just want to understand out of you guys, you know, how many of you have actually experienced or suffered with digestive upset and this doesn't necessarily need to be linked to mood, but you know, you can always let me know in the chat box, has anyone ever noticed that their mood triggers their gut health uh, symptoms or their gut health symptoms trigger their mood? I'll put my hand up because I used to suffer with horrific digestive upset for eight to nine years before I found relief and through diet. Um, that I found it both ways. When I was anxious and upset, my digestive system would flare up and I'd get awfully bloated. And then when I was awfully bloated or I was stuck on the toilet, I was also feeling really low and down. Um, so hopefully um, we'll have some good results here. So 55% of you said yes, me. 18% yes in the past. 18% sometimes and 9% said no, never. So quite a lot of you. So hopefully um, this information will help. But as I mentioned, it is what I specialize in my clinical practice, purely out of passion and coming from a place where I know how it feels. Um, so do get in touch. But um, it's such a fascinating connection between the gut and our mood. So our gut is now being called the second brain. And the reason being is that uh, I've put 90%, but they're now kind of saying 95% of serotonin is created in the gut. So 95% of the hormone responsible for feelings of happiness is created in your digestive system. So everything that you eat, everything you consume, your gut health, all plays a role in your mood. So it's so foundationally important looking after the gut to look after your mood. Now, there's a very, very fascinating connection that occurs between the brain and the gut. And they are connected by the longest cranial nerve in the body called the vagus nerve, which runs from our brains diaphragm uh, past the diaphragm into the digestive system sort of span across the body and what it acts like is a communication pathway that occurs between the brain and the gut and allows them to talk to one another all day long so you might have felt this before in your stomach you know when you get butterflies when you maybe first falling in love or you're excited you might sort of need the toilet a bit more if you're anxious or stressed you might lose your appetite if you're upset you might gain more of an appetite if you're happy. It's different for every person, but that's your brain sending signals to your gut and you feel it, it's tangible. But the gut sends signals to your brain as well. But we don't really ever sit there and go, you know what? I've been in a really bad mood for, for you know, a couple of weeks or my mood, I've been really anxious for a few months. Oh, it's my gut talking to me. We never ever do that. But that relationship exists and it's a real real thing so we need to be tuning into our gut to look after our mood additionally 70 percent of our immune system is found in the digestive system and our immune system is what controls inflammation which as i mentioned before is one of the sort of root causes of um sort of uh, triggers for depression anxiety mood related orders, uh, disorders and finally certain good beneficial friendly gut bacteria that live in our digestive system that make up part of this thing called a microbiome this collection of bacteria in our gut create neurotransmitters now one of the key neurotransmitters that our gut bacteria can create is called GABA and GABA is one of the neurotransmitters that is actually shown to be anti-anxiety. It's very calming. Um, so absolutely um, fascinating 
how the gut is playing a role in our mood and mental health. So how can we look after our gut? Well, first things first, what I would say is that if you are suffering with a gut-related disorder, so an irritable bowel disease, intolerances, um, you know, you think you have leaky gut syndrome, IBS, SIBO, um, celiac even, autoimmune conditions, things like that, um, then just take this information with a pinch of salt because sometimes certain digestive suggestions can actually make you worse, even though they're good for general gut health, can actually make you feel worse. Um, so I always suggest low and slow. Try these things very slowly, introducing them into your diet. Don't go away the next day and drink, you know, three liters of kefir and think you're going to solve your digestive problems. Um, so introduce prebiotics and probiotics. So prebiotics are fiber rich, insoluble foods that actually feed the bacteria in our gut. They feed them. And what happens is, is that bacteria in the gut proliferate and they grow and they become robust and strong and flourish. And they make up a really important barrier that live in our digestive system as well as, you know, creating those hormones I mentioned. So um, introduce prebiotic fibers. So prebiotic fibers can be found in raw garlic, raw onions, leeks, asparagus, flax seeds, oats, um, artichoke, particularly Jerusalem artichoke. So introduce those low and slow. And you can also try live fermented foods. These are foods that essentially are fermented. And during the fermentation process, they grow live bacteria within them. Now, it sounds gross, um, but it's actually super cool because essentially what you're doing is you're you're consuming live beneficial friendly bacteria they're going to help populate your digestive system so they're going to help bring some extra balance to that digestive system which some of you guys may or may not have heard of but there is um, a situation called dysbiosis which is essentially an imbalance of bacteria that can happen in the gut which can unfortunately be um, the root cause for some digestive complaints so some of my favorite live fermented foods are kefir, which is fermented dairy or coconut or water drink, kombucha, which is fermented black or green tea. I used to make kombucha during lockdown. I stopped because it was like a factory in my, in my house, but um, it's quite a fun thing to make if you're into that kind of stuff. Sauerkraut, which is fermented um, vegetables or also kimchi is another uh, similar product. And then the most easy and accessible is live yogurt, which is a great thing to have at breakfast. So if ever you're choosing yogurt, pick up live yogurt, turn it around, look at the ingredients list, and it will have funny sounding names like bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, and those are strains of beneficial bacteria that you are consuming through your breakfast. So get in those live fermented foods low and slow. Ensure you're having 30 grams of fiber a day. So 30 grams of fiber is the recommended daily intake in the UK. Fiber helps um, our bowel movements go, it helps support our digestive system, helps keep us really full, gives us that wave like consistent release of energy I was talking about at the moment, supports our healthy heart health and cholesterol levels, even supports the liver. So fiber is super important. Now, 30 grams for a plant-based diet follower would look like in a day, one cup of raspberries, one cup of black beans, one cup of whole wheat pasta, and a small handful of almonds. Obviously not in the same meal because that's not exactly the yummiest thing. But um, that's what 30 grams of fiber would look like. So remember at the beginning, I mentioned those complex carbs and those pulses and the nuts and the seeds. Eating the, and the fruits and veg, obviously. So eating all of those things is going to get you way up to that 30 grams of fiber a day, which by the way, last year they revealed in the UK that the average person consumes just 16 grams of fiber a day. So nearly half the amount that we're meant to be consuming. So fiber up, vary your diet now. We've all been working from home, well, a lot of us anyway, and I don't know who's going back, who's not, and when, and why, and whatever's happening with everyone's individual, but we have had the opportunity to be able to perhaps diversify our intake of food a little whilst eating at home, because it you know, gives you a little bit more time if you're able to get your hands on groceries. Now, going back to the workplace, I do often see people choose the same things day in, day out, and there's a very small, um, diverse range of food circulating around their diet. So try and vary your diet. You know, go to your local grocery store, or farmer's market, or Sainsbury's, or waitress, whatever, and pick something once a week that you've never tried. They go, oh my gosh, you know, like, for example, I always tell people, try and choose that cauliflower that looks like a castle, you know, it's really, really spiky, and I can never for the life of me remember the name of it, it will always leave my head. You know, pick up something like that that you've never tried, something of a different color that you haven't had that week, and 
There is a challenge called the 30 Whole Foods Challenge, which is trying to get in 30 different foods a week. Um, and that's not saying you need to have, you know, beans there, crack, uh, flax, uh, nuts there, seeds there, vegetables there. It's, you know, um, black beans, white beans, red beans, lentils, chickpeas. Those would count as different ones. So 30 different foods a week to make sure you're getting diversity in your diet. And you could try and consider a good quality probiotic. I always suggest people to work with a practitioner with probiotics because probiotics are not created equal. There are millions of different strains of bacteria. Some trigger more digestive upset than others. Um, some, I've seen it time and time again, myself included, when I was unwell, I tried a probiotic and it made me feel even worse. And that's because just taking willy-nilly a probiotic, unfortunately, doesn't fix the root cause. So do be mindful with that. But you can always try and see if it does help a little bit. And I always suggest it after people take antibiotics or if they're traveling and all the rest of it to try a good quality probiotic, of which you can ask me at the end for my suggestions if you're interested so they're just some very top level uh, gut health things that you can introduce to make sure that your bacterial balance in your digestive system is you know growing strong is thriving flourishing and setting you up to be able to produce that 95 percent of serotonin that um, contributes to our mood so now let's talk about caffeine and its role in our mood. So anyone want to let me know in the chat? Do you consume caffeine? Don't you? Why don't you? Is it for mood? How much are you having? I'll let you guys know that I, a pot of coffee a day, four cups per day. Yikes. <laughs> I used to have three. Um, I can tolerate a lot of caffeine um, because of my uh, caffeine metabolism genetically, but uh, I'm now down to one and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, one coffee a day. I always go herbal as caffeine gives me headaches. Okay, great. So I'm going to be talking about that once or twice a day. One a day. Okay, right. I think you guys are talking about coffee, but tea has caffeine in two. I spent a month off caffeine and after I've been taking it daily, it's creating a cyclical nightmare of energy lethargy. It happens, right? Coffee with mushrooms, great. Is that for Sigmatic, Mandeep? They're great. Just got a caffeine overdose two days ago. It was horrible. I know, right? It makes you feel sick. Great, Mandeep. Um, for Sigmatic are great. Zero caffeine due to anxiety. Right, so lots of stuff going on here. Now, when we consume anything with caffeine in, what happens is it actually triggers a stress response in the body, which is no wonder why people are saying that they feel awful or you know headaches or anxiety, etc. Um, because it stimulates stress in the body. And if you already are sort of suffering with mood dysregulation or mood swings or you know a little bit of anxiety here and there, putting extra stress in your body and secreting cortisol, which is our stress hormone, can really exacerbate these um, these symptoms or trigger them even. So I do recommend if you notice that caffeine makes you jittery, irritated, anxious, nauseous, headachey, mood swings, be aware and perhaps sort of um, switch up your, your caffeine intake. So the recommended daily intake, regardless of whether caffeine makes you feel bad, feel good, whoever you are, the maximum recommended daily intake is 400 milligrams per day, which is roughly five espresso shots, three cups of filter coffee, or eight cups of lightly stewed black or green tea. It's quite a lot of tea, not so much coffee there, guys. For some of you, you said you were having a bit more than that. Now, that's um, for anyone who is pregnant or trying to conceive, it's 200 milligrams maximum, and for children, it's less, so if not, zero. Um, so do be mindful, if yours is above that, that you should be already reconsidering how you're going to reduce the caffeine in your diet. And then if it's triggering any mood-related disorders, changes, anything like that, then try and swap it out. Now, caffeine is not just found in coffee. It's found in black tea, green tea, matcha, dark chocolate contains caffeine. In. For those of you who like dark chocolate after dinner and wonder why you've got a bit of a wide mind at night, replace that dark chocolate. Um, fizzy drinks are things like Diet Coke and Full Fat Coke, energy drinks, even medication. Um, so, you know, 
do be mindful of where it's hidden. Actually, to be honest, I even tell you it's found in protein powders, it's found sometimes in ice cream, protein bars, and even decaffeinated versions of coffee can have up to 20% residual caffeine still left within them. So do be mindful of where it's hidden and you can easily swap. Now, somebody mentioned that they have four Sigmatic, which I have not spoken about on here, but that's a mushroom blend um, that doesn't taste like mushrooms, so don't worry, um, but is a great one and can um, contain medic um, medicinal mushrooms, not magic mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms that can be very helpful for energy, for stress resilience, mood, etc. But otherwise, you can try turmeric lattes, which are anti-inflammatory great and for the immune system as we move into winter herbal teas so i really like rooibos red, bu red bush tea which um, i replace black tea with um chicory root coffee which is a not coffee at all it is a blend of chicory root that can be used just like an instant coffee so i make lattes with that occasionally i'll have a good uh, quality decaf coffee instead um there's also barley root coffee and um other herbal teas you know things like tulsi tea chamomile, peppermint, etc. So um, I would recommend swapping them out. Somebody said that they came off caffeine and felt awful. Go reduce over time. Don't go from having four cups of coffee one day to zero the next because it will make you feel horrible. So I do recommend cutting back by one cup over, say, a couple of weeks, and that should then make you um, it slightly easier. And the name of the mushroom tea was uh, Four Sigmatic is the brand. And somebody said, I noticed the healthy fruit teas make me want to urinate frequently. I uh, therefore, yes, we'll check for dandelion. It might have dandelion or fennel, uh, which can make you go to the toilet a little bit more often. So I would go for something um, perhaps like peppermint tea or chamomile or tulsi or ginger. So I now want to talk about sort of now that I've spoken about, okay, balance your blood sugar levels for maintenance and sort of stable mood. Make sure you've got that vitamin D and omega-3 that are crucial for your mood. Getting colors of the rainbow whenever you possibly can and be mindful of your caffeine intake so that it doesn't trigger your anxiety or stress levels and work on your gut health because it is so important. I finally want to end before I have time for some questions on how to have a healthy relationship with food. Now, I cannot do this in one slide. Everyone is individual and unique and having a good relationship with food is one of the hardest things to do. You know, myself as a nutritionist, you know, I think about and talk about food and nutrition all day long and it is difficult to have a well-balanced relationship. But there are a few things to be mindful of. Firstly, you know, try to avoid stress emotional eating when you can, and that sounds easier than it than it than you know easy to say, but if you notice that when you are stressed, you reach for certain foods, when you're anxious, you reach for food or you don't eat food, you perhaps limit food. Um, try to spot that either by keeping a journal or just being a little bit intuitive and try to stop that in its tracks because that can lead to this cycle of having a poorer relationship with food, which therefore means that you then um, put stigmas and connotations around food. They become sort of filling a hole or a coping mechanism, which is something that we really want to move away from when it comes to mood and food so um try to spot it and stop it in its tracks um and i would say one of the best ways to stop to sort of move away from doing that is practicing mindful intuitive eating so if you're really interested in it i do suggest getting the book by evelyn treblin um called intuitive eating um you could type it in on amazon i don't think i said her name right then but it's quite a complicated name and um, there are two authors of the intuitive eating guidebook and the, it's like the bible of intuitive eating and essentially what it is is stripping back all the connotations around food, weight management, um, you know, treats, um, negative um, sort of physical um, attributions, etc. Um, so I do recommend having a read of that if, if this is something that resonates with you. But two top tips is practice mindful eating. And that can be a really easy way to sort of get a little bit more sort of comfortable with food. So first up, try and distinguish between that hunger and that non hunger. So Am I reaching for that chocolate because I'm bored, because I'm stressed, because I'm anxious, because I'm happy, because I'm excited? Am I reaching for that chocolate because I'm a little bit low in energy and I want to pick me up or I want something sweet or perhaps I've got PMS um, or perhaps, you know, I just want it and that's the way it is. I saw an advert on TV. Try to distinguish between that just in yourself. Just ask yourself when you're reaching for it. And that is the first step in sort of being able to practice mindful eating because you're distinguishing whether something's for hunger or not. And if it's not for hunger, Try and replace it with something with self-care. So pick up your phone and call a friend, have a bath, put on a nice candle, do something and make something healthy in the kitchen, etc. Um, 
and eat mindfully at mealtimes. So when you are eating at mealtimes, you know, put your knife and fork down between your meals rather than doing this. Don't be distracted by, you know, TV, phone, work, laptop, so that you miss your hunger cues. Um, put the food on your plate rather than eating out of the fridge, out of the cupboard, etc. Um, those would be just my, my, my two top tips that you could go away and implement today. But I mean, practicing mindful eating and working on your relationship with food is a really huge, um, huge part of, of mood and, and food and um, is something that I would recommend again working with a practitioner of which I um, myself or one of my colleagues um, I could recommend to you and finally the 80 20 rule which is what I want to leave you guys with as my last final tip and this is how I live my life genuinely 80% of the time and it's not a rule by the way sorry because I don't like rules around food it is a guide 80% of the time eat well balanced meals hydrate stay under the caffeine limit, don't eat too much sugar. Uh, I mean, eat, um, uh, yeah, don't eat too much sugar. Try to stay under the 14 units of alcohol. Take your vitamins or get in your, your phytonutrients, your antioxidants, antioxidants, whatever it is. 20% of the time, you need to do what you want. You need to eat for your soul. You need to be able to have that gin and tonic, that burger, you know, have, um, I'm trying to think, have that pizza, have that chocolate bar, whatever it is. Because being able to 80% of the time look after your body and 20% of the time look after your soul is the perfect balance that I personally think. And, and that's the premise that I work with all of my clients. So you've got to let your hair down. You've got to enjoy food, but you've also got to set your body up for health and well-being. And it's not an all or nothing with nutrition ever. And anyone that says that, please be skeptical. It is not an all or nothing when it comes to health. Um, it's definitely um, having a well-balanced relationship with food. Um, so my final top tips before I answer some questions to take away. Find movement in the exercise you enjoyed. I haven't even had time to talk about the importance of exercise and mood, but I know you guys have had some great classes today. But, you know, find what works for you because exercise can be a great mood booster. Schedule me time. I say this to every one of my clients because most people don't invest enough in self-care, myself included a lot of the time. Schedule in some time to look after yourself because that is so important for me, particularly if you're running around at home with kids, you run your own business or you work for a business, you work long hours, or maybe you don't even, um, you know, have that much on your plate, but you just don't look after yourself. Um, schedule in some me time for your mood. Get outside, particularly during the heat wave, for 20 minutes a day of direct sunlight on your skin to get your vitamin D or otherwise go for that supplement from Better You or any other vitamin D3 supplement. Reduce that need for stimulants such as caffeine. Um, stay under that 400 milligrams or less if you notice it triggers anxiety and mood. Stay hydrated, haven't even been able to talk about that, but make sure you're having your 1.5 to 2 litres of water every day, particularly when it's hot. Work on your gut health, which hopefully I've given you lots of tips and tricks to do. And finally, Try to stick to that 80-20% guide and you're set up for, for health, both from a mental health point of view, physical health point of view, and a well-balanced relationship with food. So thank you guys so much. I can see some questions popping in. So please do pop your questions in the chat or the Q&A. I am offering in the digital goodie bag 15% off all of my nutrition packages. So I know you'll be getting the details from Live Well soon, but please do connect with me on um, Instagram. So my handle is Clarissa Lenher Nutrition. I'm always sharing top tips, tricks, um, products that I like genuinely, not that I'm paid for, um, recipes, which I haven't done so much of at the moment as I am currently away, but um, I do share lots of sort of healthy treats and recipes, things like that. And if you're interested in consultations, please do get in touch with me. Um, you can email my assistant info at clarissalenher.com. Her name is Hannah, or you can get in touch with me, clarissa at clarissalenher.com. So thank you guys. And if you have to scoot off, thank you for joining Live Well on this day of well-being. And I hope you've enjoyed the session and I hope I've lifted your mood. And I'm looking forward to connecting with you soon. Um, Evelyn Tribble, thank you. And it's titled Intuitive Eating. So which anti-inflammatory foods do you recommend for hormone acne relief and support for alopecia? Um, I'm not sure that, that the inflammatory foods would be what I would recommend for hormonal acne because I'm not sure it's the inflammation that's triggering the acne. Acne can have many root causes, particularly one in gut health, um, but also with different hormone imbalance because what does that mean? Is your progesterone high? Is your estrogen low? Is your estrogen high? Um, so I'm afraid I can't answer that but i can tell you that anti-inflammatory foods are all the things that i spoke about the omega-3 vitamin d is anti-inflammatory colorful fruits and vegetables um turmeric you know things like that 
What about algae oil? Yep, algae oil can be a great way to get in your omega-3 if you, if you like the algae oil, for sure. Didn't even um, put that on my list, but that's a great shout. Um, interest in omega-3 supplement, taking Solgar brown omega-3. Is it a good one to take? Yeah, Solgar's pretty good. Um, I really like a company called Bear Biology um, because they do one that's specifically for mood. So the EPA to DHA ratio is really um, well blended um, to be able to support um, your mood. So I would look at Bear Biology. Um, but otherwise, you know, Solgar's a good one too. Um, I also like Wiley's Alaskan fish oil because it's really sustainably cool. And also I would recommend Bear Biology too because they make sure there's no mercury, um, which can be contained in some large fish and omega-3 oils. Um, do you keep a food diary for the guidance or just by experience? I found using a food journal is really good to be on track, but put me on anxious on my daily intake. So my goal. So, I mean, I personally don't recommend counting calories and, and look, counting foods and things like that as a healthy relationship with food. Um, uh, you know, I, so I don't personally think that's a, a well-balanced relationship with food. You know, you want to be able to be intuitive and eat well-balanced meals and, and sort of not count on calories. I'm not really a calorie controlled counting uh, nutritionist. I don't think it's the right approach. Um, but keeping a food journal, if it makes you anxious, I don't think is the right thing then for you. Um, perhaps keeping a mood uh, journal could be slightly better for you. Um, and, and, you know, you could talk a little bit about the foods you were eating rather than counting how much you had or etc i hope that answers your question cc um i have crohn's what probiotic would you recommend unfortunately unless you're working with me um i cannot recommend particularly for crohn's um because again it would be it would concern whether or not you at what point you are with crohn's whether you're in remission or not and whether you've had a stool a thorough stool test because um different strains of bacteria are recommended for different kinds of um dysbiosis etc so unfortunately i can't recommend that for you exactly with crohn's um, um, I do really like VSL3 though. Um, that's quite a good one. Um, anti and all best anti-inflammatory that's easy to digest. Again, I, I think I answered that before. Um, you're anonymous, so I can't call you by your name. Sorry. Um, is it ugly to mean a good su supplement to take for a sense of time? Yes, it's pretty good. Um, again, you know, you don't want to be taking loads of supplements if you know they're not working, but it can be quite good because what l glutamine does is it actually helps heal some of the junctions that can occur that line the digestive system. So it can be quite healing. Um, that's why people drink cabbage juice, um, which I don't really recommend because it's far too fatty and, and difficult to do. But yeah, l glutamine can be good. Um, really does depend on what you're trying to, to achieve. But yeah. If it works for you, it works for you. Um, what do you recommend for a vegetarian who suffers from flatulence? Um, eat pulses for protein, but not exactly, and do suffer from wind. Um, I mean, I would recommend checking in whether or whether, you know, you could soak your pulses. Um, so soak pulses or um, nuts and seeds if they trigger your flatulence. Um, I would, or you can cook them with kombu, which is a kind of seaweed, which can get rid of some of the stuff that um, surrounds beans and pulses that triggers wind. Um, if it's really, really bad, then you know you need to work with a practitioner to get to the root cause of why you're not digesting these things. But pulses are a trigger for lots of people, and unfortunately, that is part of being a vegetarian diet. But what I would say is people tend to, the soaking helps, but also um, sometimes tempeh um, can be slightly better on the stomach as a protein source or tofu. Um, Rita, if it's still not working for you, I'd recommend then either you've got to go for sort of different vegetarian protein sources or um, you need to sort of look a little bit into the root cause as to why your, your bacteria and your digestive system aren't breaking down the pulses effectively. Um, so yeah, that would be my recommendation. I, I wouldn't know more unless we had a little bit more detail on that. Um, but you know, tempeh tofu tend to be slightly easier to digest if you've tried those things already. Just going through um, any other questions. We'll try tempeh. Tempeh is a great protein source, a complete protein source, and it's really full of um, beneficial bacteria. So it's a probiotic, it's a fermented food. Uh, so it's really good for your gut as well. So that actually might be like a win-win for you. Um, so hopefully that helps, Rita. Rachel, I'm veggie, but eating loads of fruit and veg makes me bloated vegetarian diet does that i grew up vegetarian for i was vegetarian for 27 years 26 years um and it does 
Are there types of veg I should avoid? So lots of people find that certain vegetables can trigger their digestive system. Again, we're all individual and unique and what works for one person doesn't always work for everyone. But often cauliflower and broccoli, Brussels sprouts and kale can be quite um, problematic for people. So I would always recommend don't eat them raw. You know, try not to eat too many raw vegetables that can trigger bloating. Um, so perhaps steam them, um, lightly sort of... Um, uh, grill them you know bake them um or stir fry them so that they're sort of more cooked uh those ones can tend to be but sometimes um if you really notice that fruit is making you bloated that even sort of you know things like tomatoes or, or you know spinach or uh, aubergine or peppers is making you bloated um there are certain foods called fodmaps um again you should always work with a practitioner on a fodmap diet but um those foods are known to trigger bloating and can um give people relief for only a short period of time should you ever be on a fodmap diet and um, to try and figure out which foods are triggering digestive upset or not is the wild alaskan omega-3 by wiley spinus yes it is yeah it's one that i really like that and bear biology what are foods to avoid for high cholesterol? Well, I'm assuming that you mean high LDL cholesterol, so lipodensin, lipoprotein, um, not HDL, because HDL is your protective good cholesterol. Um, again, it depends on what your diet is. Is it genetic? Is it not? But otherwise, you know, eating lots of fiber um, is fantastic. Oats, um, you know, making sure that you've got lots of colors of the rainbow and antioxidants in your diet, so things like just uh, um, reds, blues, oranges, uh, and greens on your plate always. Um, you have lots of nuts and seeds for fiber trying to make sure that you're not eating too much saturated fat so you know limit red meat limit um high fat dairy produce um coconut milk and coconut oil um yeah hopefully those are just some uh, sort of top tips all right guys Thank you so much for loads of questions. Um, and yeah, I hope to connect with you guys all and I um, hope you enjoyed a wonderful day and live well. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much, Clarissa. That was just brilliant. As always, loads and loads of information. I've written loads of notes of all these things I'm gonna go and do now after this. So really, really brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, Hannah, I hope you're listening to this. I need to see my notes and <laughs> I can't see them. I don't know how where they've gone you're welcome but thank you so so much right um there we go now I know what I'm doing and saying thank you so much Clarissa um you're welcome. so let me just check and give everybody all the last bits of information about your goodie bags so uh, that's the end of Power Up Your Life with Fabletics. I do hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to thank Fabletics very much for this um, event. I hope you really enjoyed it. As mentioned at the start, they put an amazing offer in your digital, digital goodie bag, so please do give them a try. You'll receive your digital goodie bag via email on Monday, so look out for it. And then you'll also receive on Tuesday um, your survey. So we really would appreciate your feedback on how the event went, what you liked, what you didn't like. Um, and again, there's an opportunity to win another amazing Fabletics prize. So have a lovely evening, everyone. And I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks.